My guest in studio is um, Rushdin Jazz, known in the industry as Mr. Jazz. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. He is a 38-year-old Cape Town boy from Athlone. Yeah, yeah. Brothers and sisters? Two siblings, one older, one younger. Oh, you're the sisters, middle child. Sisters, yeah, yeah. Oh, but you're the only boy, so you're yes. spoiled, right? <laughs> well, you spoiled could do whatever you wanted to do. Are they also musical? No, not at all, actually. Nobody actually in my family is musical. Yeah. My, mom, my mom can hold a note, though. <laughs> How did you know you were musical? When did you discover? Um, on high school, I used to sort of be a closet singer, you know, for the, for the girls in my class. But, you know, we all have our insecurities and stuff. So I never, ever decided to come out, you know. But I always do. Valentine's Day, I observed these talented young people in, on school perform. And I thought, you know, I could do that. But, you know, I'm fearful and whatever. And so only as I, I got a bit older um, in the later years, uh uh, did I decide to actually explore more of that avenue? You know? So did you have like a falsetto voice when you were singing with the girls? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of boys to men at the, that that time, you know. Aye. And Aye. Uh, and interestingly enough, yes, I actually did, but I was very at the time reluctant to go the falsetto route. You know what I mean? Because you you're still in the process of learning more about your voice. But certainly, a lot of time was spent in the falsetto radio. Really. <laughs> what is what is your voice range? What uh, what would you say? Um. I can do some, you know, I, I, I can do some low stuff, Frank Sinatra stuff. I can do middle. So you've got your Bob Marley. Because my influences are quite diverse. You know, it's like Bob Dylan from a writing perspective, Bob Marley, um, Dean Martin, and then more contemporary would be like your uh, Jason Mraz, Jim Maraguay, Pharrell Williams, um, the Bee Gees, a lot of the falsetto. Also. Uh, the application of the falsetto voice from that perspective, yeah. So it's quite a, a plethora of different inspirations and influences that that it's quite evident in my in in, in my songs, yeah. which we'll hear later. <laughs> Let, let's let's go back to the beginning, ultimately. So, essentially, in 2010, you right. you released your first radio single, which right. was "Feel for Life," yeah. and it got it was well received. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was uh, in the top 30 charts, top 10 charts. It played at number one. Um, pretty good, and you even got played on in UK and Thailand. Yeah, UK yeah. and Thailand, what an interesting mix there. Yeah, <laughs> how did it get to Thailand? <laughs> it's amazing how these things work, eh? because people just hear something, you know, and then you just get a random message, sort of like today, <laughs> and uh, call it synchronicity. You know, somebody messaged me and they said they're having um, an African Week uh, tribute oh. uh, in the UK, a couple of radio stations, and then they heard of the song and they wanted to do do a telephonic interview with me, and they playlisted the song. So I was very grateful for that. Yeah. And like many Cape Town boys, you you got your start there at the Joseph Stone. Yeah. Um, basically, you you played along Jody Abrams and Ernest Isabel and Emo Adams that group. Yeah. Um, at uh, in Bugsy Malone. Bugsy yes? Malone. Yeah, that was my very first stage. How old were you? Uh, I would imagine about ten. Hey, eh? I think I was standard three. Wow. <laughs> I was standard four. So that must have been cool. Yeah. So you definitely <laughs> had that flair, and of course, a great group of people: Farouk Valley Omar was uh, was the the director and um then did you did you work with Tully Peterson and David Kramer or no, no, no. it was just been Farouk was yeah, uh, yeah. and then jump over to a movie you made a movie yeah <laughs> and you made how a did movie. that happen well uh, um an organization called Central Casting Agencies I'm not sure if they still exist at this juncture but they gave me a call uh to feature in a movie it was a very really small cameo role um with uh, James Brolin from the Cedis Hotel, so I was very grateful for that opportunity. <laughs> In fact, it's uh, ironic actually because I, um, I'm Muslim and uh, I had to play a, 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 a Christian shepherd boy, so it was, it was really awesome, you know. Well, and you've worked with all of them. I mean, so we're talking about Jody and Alistair and Emo and 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 Farouk and also Nasli George and 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 uh, Camillo Lombard and uh, Sophia Foster, Claire Phillips. You've literally worked with everybody. Yeah, yeah, I've been very v- privileged to, to, to share the space and, and to sponge and learn from some really, really significant uh, teachers, you know what I mean? But, but it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's not that it's a small pool, but, yeah. but it's, a, it's, it's, it's all, you all kind of come from Athlone. <laughs> it's very interesting. It is very interesting. Yes. And Cape Town particularly is, 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 is a relatively small um, in terms of the music industry, you know what I mean? So, and everybody's connected to somebody that's connected to somebody, mm. you know what I mean? So it's very interesting, yeah. 
So it is interesting that that uh, this 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 musicality develops um, out of out of this Athlone area, out of uh, the Joseph Stone, um, and everybody is fostered and and taken to various uh, schools and places. But then in two thousand and four, you managed, you went into management. Yeah, my my academic background is initially was marketing and business communication. Yes. I was very really, really lucky to get a, a bursary to to pursue marketing uh, through the Graduate School of Marketing uh, IMM. And um, so this was prior to my music school, um, where, and I was really grateful to get a scholarship there as well wow. to, to attend a local music school. And so I've always had sort of a, an affinity or, or, or flirtation with the business side initially, you know, the nuts and the bolts. Because I'm an entrepreneur, I love business. It's and important so, if you're going to be a, if you're going to be if you're going to manage your own career. Absolutely. And so I think. Um, that became a bit evident uh, at Prompt, which was the name of the music school. And so I got approached by a band, uh, an amazing uh, urban soul funk hip hop jazz fusion band called Super Dan. And they asked me to manage them for uh, just under a year. They went on to release uh, a couple of radio singles and a music video. And then, as you know, infamously, bands part ways, you know, <laughs> and uh, to pursue solo ventures and stuff. So I'm very grateful for that experience. I learned a lot. Uh, needless sure. to say, I don't have any intention of man managing any bands really? again. So <laughs> you were then left jobless. But just to go back, I mean, when you were doing, when you were at the community college, it was Camillo Lombard who was one of your lecturers. Yeah. And what an amazing person. I mean, really, really, you couldn't have hoped for, for, for a better person to, to work with you. Quintessential, absolutely. Yeah. So when did, um, when did Superdan break up? When did your management uh, uh, career end? That was about end? 2003 or 2004. And... Um, yeah, I think, and then I decided I am now going to uh, uh, gather all these sort of pearls of wisdom and and apply it to my own musical journey, you know. And so I started to invest into um, my own music after that. You know. In terms of writing, writing and yeah, and had you had you been writing all along? I started writing. In fact, the very first song I wrote um, was called "Who Are You." Okay, come on, let's hear about it. Come, <laughs> come, 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 come. How old were you when you wrote it? No, I was, was I was first year in music school, and I'll never forget. And you're gonna love this story because Clive Ridgeway's name is gonna be mentioned. Yes, uh, Clive. We got given. We just started our first lecture, and they got they gave us homework to do. They wanted to sort of gather uh, and establish at which point of our songwriting uh, journey we at, you know, because I think on some level, everybody knows how to write a song, you know, there's a bridge, there's a chorus, you know, just the essentials, you know, I'm assuming. And so they said, guys, go home, choose a topic, uh, write a song, bring it to, to, to college the next day. And so we can, we can see where you guys are at, you know, and it's amazing. I wrote the song and it's, it was about, um, you know, the, the basic human need that we all have to fit in. And, and the dissonance that we all experience to all, at the same time trying to be yourself, you know, so you want to fit in, you know, but you also want to be yourself, you know. And so the song was about wearing masks and about discovering, let the world see the truth, there will never be another you. Uh, some what of did the, they think some, about Some it? of the lyrics. It was amazing. I, I got 90% for the, for the song. And then um, years later, I, I shared it with Clive Ridgway because I did the Cape Town School of Songwriting course. And Clive said to me, and I'll never forget that that is one of the most profound um, songs that, that he believes uh, to come out of Cape Town. So I was really grateful for that. And I haven't oh. changed a single word from the song. And then I recorded an acoustic version of the song, which is also going to be on the album. So yeah. Well, I'm not going to share the song I wrote when I was 16 years old with you then, because I didn't get those kinds of accolades at all. I wrote one song when I was 16, and, and then I gave it up. I gave it up for good measure. So you, you studied and trained in songwriting with Camillo, and then you then furthered yeah. your songwriting credentials with Clive Ridgway. Why did you feel the need to, well, to work more on that? Uh, from a prompt music school perspective, it was very broad. So they covered everything from songwriting to music business to th music theory to stage presentation. You know, so it was it was a vast range of subjects. Uh, I majored in songwriting and music business, and dabbled in guitar. Uh, you know, people ask me if I play guitar, and I say I play one chord, and I'm really good. <laughs> you know, practice, <laughs> practice makes perfect. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I majored in in. in songwriting and the music business because I resonated deeply with those two topics and then years later I decided you know I've always been um, sort of known in my family as the eternal student you know what I mean so I've always been committed to to continuous personal development and so I just decided one day you know what I want to do a songwriting course and take it to the next level and I just googled songwriting and it just so happens that Cape Town School of Songwriting popped up 
It's always a bit of a serendipity, you know. Well, how many songwriting schools are there? Okay? Yeah, I, well, I don't think there's a lot there. You're right. Eh? <laughs> so I, was, I was grateful that... Because that's how I got to meet Clive, you know what I mean? And, so and Clive ultimately was instrumental in producing one of your singles. Two of my singles. Two of your actually. singles. Yeah, and I mean, Clive is amazing. Clive is... Uh, I mean, he's been with KFM for 17 years. He grew KFM from from a from a very small station to over a million listeners. Absolutely, and and I mean, he's written for the likes of Judith Sapuma, <laughs> Kirk Tadden, Blackbird, <laughs> Jonathan Butler, Doctor Victor and the Rasta Rebels. Uh, so I'm really grateful to have a song written for me, and it's a special song because the song is called Inside Out, and I'm sure we'll get to that a bit later. Where I was literally in a process of having. Some of my insights taken out. <laughs> taken out. <laughs> well, well, let's go there because that is, I mean, that is a very instrumental part of your life. I mean, that right. must have changed you severely. Right. And right. this is the 26th of September, 2012. What happened? And so, um, and so basically I wrote a song just to get some additional context. I wrote a song 13 years ago called The Calling. And that was to inspire myself and others to answer what they believe to be their calling and their passion, you know. And fulfill what they believe to be their sole purpose on this planet. And I, I never finished the song. Uh, the song was inspired by Johnny Clegg, uh, particularly his ability to fuse English and indigenous language. Uh, I really resonated deeply with that. And then the song wasn't finished, just parked it off in the archive for a while. And then on the 26th of September 2012, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. How, how did you know to be? I mean, I often wonder how do people know to even go and go to the doctor? What right. symptoms were, were you displaying? Right. Actually, the first one to ask me that question in, in this context of an interview is because, you know, cancer is something that affects everybody, if not yourself, somebody in your circle, you know, and um, uh, particularly, you know, men around testicular cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, colorectal cancer. These are cancers that, that are not often, uh, they aren't, I would imagine, safe spaces to, to dialogue around these things, you know, for whatever reasons, as, you know, men and their pride and their mm. egos and stuff. And so I, the only symptom I had was there was some blood in my output. And um, because of my age, I was told by four different uh, doctors that, it's, that it was piles. Wow. But you had, you'd been to doctors. You were clearly concerned. It wasn't, ah, it'll go away. No, it's something I ate. No, no, no. You I, were concerned. You knew something was wrong. Definitely. And I think I'm also, um, I'm, my further academic studies is, is, is professional coaching. So I do life coaching. And, and that's what actually what, what I believe saved my life is that, because coaching is about helping people become more aware of how they're showing up in terms of, you know, physiologically, emotionally, you know, and to become more conscious. And so because of that um, level of consciousness, not, not perfection by any means, I, I challenged uh, the status quo. So I, I knew for the fact that, in fact, it was inspired by Tony Robbins is one of my inspirations. And he believes that you always have to get multiple combination opinions. I so agree with you. When it comes to health. You so know? agree with you. And so even after I got the first... Uh, feedback from the first GP saying it was piles. I did my own research and uh, the thought definitely crossed my mind that it could be uh, colon cancer and therefore I went to another th three more and I understand and have no judgment towards any of these GPs you know because they are only human like we are um, and there are uh, tangible sort of gross generalizations or statistics that one can find to justify a statement that says you 36 you're too young this is known to occur in your 50s you know what i mean so i i, I get that you know this is also the reason why one should have a gp that one has had for 10 12 15 years yeah. who at least knows who you are i do believe that so even if you get other opinions i yeah. do think that somebody who who knows you yeah, I definitely. It. In fact, I, I one of the GPs I went to was one that I went for for long. But you, you know, I think one needs to understand that they're human first, man. You know, and and busy and and busy. You know, and 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 statistics sucks though. It sucks though. You, in a sense, exactly. you kind of feel passed over. Definitely, because in that same week that I got diagnosed, I was working for Old Mutual at the time as as a, a financial planner, and one of my colleagues in his fifties had passed away uh, of the same thing. Wow. And so scary, that was one scary. of the that was one of the most challenging uh, periods. Um, you know, so I, so you, know, you went and you got four separate uh, opinions. Yeah. The fourth one diagnosed you. Well, the fourth one still thought it was pals initially, and then he put me on a fiber su a supplement to to soften uh, you know the output. So that uh, because you know the thing with the, the uh, sort of paradoxical by nature, because you know because of the mere makeup and location of pals, you know, um, pals can take forever to heal. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? As long as as uh, um, we are we are consuming, you know, um, the, it's always going to be dif- difficult for for that to heal. And so, therefore, um, uh, people in the medical field make make assumptions. You know what I mean? That that, that it has to be that. And so he put me on a, on a, fi- uh, a fiber su- supplement, which I was on, and there was still uh, I was still fi- finding blood in, in in my output. And so. Therefore, he said, "Okay, let's sit, let's set you up an appointment with a uh, um, gastro uh, enterologist." Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they discovered, yeah, there was a tumor. How uh, long between symptoms and diagnosis? Um, probably about s- six months, plus minus six months. And in that period, I was going, I was consulting four different GPs. You know? And um, yeah, it's it's actually yeah. It's so, how do you feel when you hear the word cancer? Wow, so four years later, uh, I still, I'm actually only now in a position where I'm actually sharing it, you know, through the song and through this crowdfunding campaign, which we'll, I'm sure we'll chat about later on, but it's really a process, you know, it's, there's no finish line. Um, one thing that has resonated with me the most about that chapter of my life is that it's not how much time we have, it's ultimately how we choose to occupy our time. You know, cause, I, you think, know. I think, I <laughs> think... It's difficult to say, but something like cancer really crystallizes that in one's in, in one's mind. Absolutely. You know, at 36 years old, you still are we young. You're kind of just starting, and then suddenly there's this. You really have to confront mortality. Absolutely. And yeah. then you do. Re- I, I I've spoken to many people um, who have said this exact same thing. They've changed their lives. Their things have become crystallized for them. Yeah. Um, it, it was. It's been big. I mean, it's a big thing in many people's lives. So they found a tumor. Yeah. And then what? And then my mom took my hand as we left the hospital and she said, we're going to take the, we're going to walk this journey together. Oh, and then, so um, three major surgeries Yo. later, um, an ileostomy bag attached to the right side oh, of my I thought, tummy. I thought my producer had written that incorrectly. I thought it was a carlostomy bag. No, it's an ileostomy bag. It's an bag. ileostomy bag. Yeah. For eight months while on chemo. Sheesh. So they removed part of your colon yeah. and they gave you a bag and you were on chemo. Yeah. Hectic. Yeah, no, it was very, very challenging, very challenging. And just your whole plumbing system for that eight eight months is is, is, is unconventional, you know. <laughs> and um, wow, it's actually quite interesting. Very few people know this. Uh, there aren't many videos because I'm, I'm very big on quality, so there aren't many videos out there. But there's one one video of me on YouTube um, in 2013, paying tribute to Bob Marley, who's one of my biggest inspirations, who also left this world via cancer, you know. And I sang the redemption song, but not a lot of people know that um, in that video, I was on chemo and I, I, I was actually, I was actually I had the ileostomy bag attached to my tummy while singing the song. So you still worked while you were going through this process? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Why? Yeah. Um, well, I wasn't working because I was off for 19 months from working. I was at All Mutual at the time, so I couldn't work. You know what I mean? And so I had to stand in the UIF queue and. And be grateful for the 1,500 rand, nee. you know, and <laughs> you know that story. <laughs> nee. And so the music and prayer and support of family and friends is what, what was my sustenance during that period. And so I, I continued to, to perform, you know, because it was my, my spirit needed it, you know what I mean? And so that was a significant performance for me, singing that song while on chemo and while having the ileostomy bag attached to my tummy. So, you know. When the doctors told you about the diagnosis, right. did they say you caught it at a good time, that you're lucky, or what your chances are 50 50? Or, yeah, yeah. you know, how did they approach it with you? Sure. It's a, <laughs> um, my, I met with the oncologist <clears throat> at Randebosch Medical Clinic, and um, she's a wonderful lady, and she's also very, very known to be very sort of. Um, explicit, you know. And they have to be, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm speaking from from experience as yeah. well. So, uh, both myself and a very dear friend of mine, and I, uh, that word cancer, and you got to meet an oncologist. Yeah. And they're sitting there very seriously telling you stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of don't believe it. It's like, what? No, wait, hang on a second, stop. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah. And yeah, then you go home and you say, no, I don't believe this. I need to do. I need to do my. There's, there's got to be a homeopathic way out of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never dabbled in the in the homeopathic way, but uh, I did the worst thing that I would advise anybody to do, and that's Google. Oh no, you I must know, Google. Uh, you have to be in control. <laughs> you have to feel like you've got control. And and so you Google, and you know, because you, cause now you hear about five year survival rates and stuff like that. Exactly. You know, and, and, yes, and, you got that. Okay. And you know what does that mean? You know, and, and then they speaking of like seventy percent. So if you go on this chemo, it's 
65% and if you go on this type of chemo, it's 85%. If you go on this type of chemo, which is sim- similar, it's 89%. But know, it costs 25,000 rand a shot. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, mine was eight rounds of chemo at um, 8,000 a pop. It's not too bad. You had a cheap chemo. Yeah, you had a cheap, you got off lightly. You got through. off lightly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was so... Yeah, so you, you know the worst thing you can do is Google, um, and so that's why with this project that I'm busy with now, um, I'm hoping to create a video, you know, um, inspired by the song called The Calling. Well, there's the connection. So so mm. while you're undergoing chemo, and you did a tribute to Bob Marley, and you're facing your own possible mortality, right? Uh, you revisited The Calling, the song you'd written all those years before. Yes, but actually before that, uh, Clive, uh, who's a very dear friend and mentor, um, he sent me a song that that he had written a very long time ago because Clive, pro- Clive is a prolific songwriter, mm. you know, as you know. And so he said he has a song, this whimsical song about love called Inside and Out, and he sent me the track while I was in hospital and then subsequently being discharged, we, we started working on the song. So that was my 2014 um, summer single, which also did really, really well. And it's ironic that it was called Inside and Out. <laughs> True, hey? <laughs> True. Yeah. I mean, Clive, Clive, thanks you very much. He says... Um, Thrilled with the end results of Inside and Out, he loved working with this young man. And he obviously was thinking of you. I mean, he wrote the song and he produced the song and mm-hmm. he wanted it for you, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. I mean, that's a good reason oh, to deal grateful, with the cancer yeah. and live, right? Yeah, absolutely. I would say so. You've, you've accomplished a lot since then. I mean, you've, you've been part of, of the music exchange. Um, you've worked with, gosh, I mean, a ton of people. And then let's just go to 2015, 16 days of activism. Yeah. You work with a lot of um, associations and organizations to assist people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that part of your mission? Definitely. I think that's why where my uh, um, my inspiration from Bob Dylan comes from. You know, like a couple of months ago, I was watching the the behind the scenes footage. I'm not sure if you've seen it of the making of We Are the World Mm-mm. from the 80s. It's just Absolutely remarkable where you got to see how Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, and Lionel Richie Work and, together. and Quincy Jones wow. brought all these people. 42. I've got chills. Quintessentially Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, uh, uh, Cindy Loper, uh, to name a few, you know, uh, uh, um, all in the same room, all parking the egos at the door, all committed to this, this cause. Uh, I think it was to raise funds for the famine in, in uh, um, Ethiopia at the time. Right. And I was deeply touched by that. And Bob Dylan has made his name um, not only as a, as a prolific storyteller and songwriter, but, but for always being known to be associated with causes around you. Human, social consciousness. Social consciousness. Yep, absolutely. You know, humanitarian work. And so... And, and yeah. so you, your music is also available for free on SoundCloud, for example. I mean, it's not... It's on uh, SoundCloud. Inside Out and Love is in the House is also available on iTunes as well. You know. And not that expensive either. <laughs> um, so so you, the, the Calling is not only a, a single, but it's an album. It's your debut full-on album. How many lots of songs? Yeah. And you're hoping to crowdfund that as well? No. So the album is basically ah, done. Confused. The album is done because it's been 13 years in the making. And, and what's so nice about it is, like I said, you... All my inspirations and influences like Bob Dylan, Bob Marley. So you're going to get some some soul on the album. There's some spoken word because I love poetry. So there's spoken word on the album. There's soul, there's jazz. Inside Out is a bit of a reggae song. So there's elements of that. The Calling was inspired by Johnny Clegg. So there's an Afro-pop uh, vibes, which sort of attribute to some of our own heroes in our country, like Maria Makleba, Super Hot Sticks, you know. And so I think there's going to be something for everybody. And um, so... The, the Calling is the definitive uh, last song uh, of the album, and I'm very, very grateful um, that that is going to be the name of the album because I've been dabbling with different names. It's you know? a good <laughs> name, and it's got so much meaning, and that is only going to be released next year. Early early in the summer, yes. Early um, next year in the summer, December, January, February. No, actually, um, I was telling people lately when people have money again. <laughs> so we're looking uh, at March. I think it's March, March April. <laughs> Yeah, it's around April's also my birthday month. Incidentally, my birthday month. So, do we get to hear anything of it? Or yeah, it's snippets? actually it's gone to radio uh, already. Um, it's going to be available in the next couple of weeks on iTunes as well. There's a crowdfunding campaign, which is what my my spirit is is 
very devoted to at the moment. To Connected to uh, cancer awareness. Yeah, and I'm using the song to um, hopefully, with God's grace, create my first official music video for the song called The Calling to inspire courage, hope, and faith for, for people um, going through personal life challenges. Because I've never at any juncture in retrospect thought or think that my cancer experience is more or less important than somebody's divorced or somebody that got retrenched yesterday, you know what I mean? Or somebody that child's on drugs at the moment. I think, Why not? I think, Why not? Because it's your experience. I think everybody's, I think it's, everybody gets given personal life experiences, man. And so the guy begging at the robots, who just got released out of prison. So I, I just got out of an interview recently uh, on Heart over the weekend. And as I left the building, there was this guy who was just ended up talking to me about he just got released from prison, you know. And I shared my cancer journey with him. He was like, and then I said to him, just be grateful, you know. Uh, don't spend too much time in the past. Only go to the past to pick together pearls of wisdom, put it in your backpack, but focus on the future. Because somebody this morning got told that they've got three more months on this planet. True that. You know what I mean? Nobody so, no. gets through this life without suffering. Nobody is I mean, Teflon coated. No, well, maybe our <laughs> president. I don't know. We shall see. We <sighs> shall see. And so everything that you're saying makes a few things clear to me. The one one is is the light, the coaching yeah, aspect. Yeah, right. uh, is, is that the um, where did when did that come in as part of your your, so your toolkit? And so after I graduated at music school, and obviously prior to that was the marketing uh, academic background in the music. And then after the Super Dan chapter, just before deciding to go and into my own music, um, I used to be a member of Toastmasters because I love public speaking. Oh, yeah. And in all the organizations that I've been blessed to work at, they always used to use me to do in, yeah, sort of inspirational talks and stuff. And I'll never forget once I got asked to do a talk just after people got given a letter of retrenchment. <laughs> And uh, I, I pulled it off because I basically just spoke about goal setting. Because you know, at, at that moment, the, the best thing you can think is, oh, is what you're going to do moving forward. You know wow, I, mean? I would have smacked you in the face. <laughs> Don't try to cheer me up when I've just been fired. Really, let me be upset. For I, you. It's important <laughs> eh, to honor that process. You're absolutely right. And then somebody at Toastmasters said to me that you know what, you 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 should actually consider uh, um, pursuing academic studies and professional coaching. Um, and then I, I reflected and I thought to myself, you know what, I, I can get on stage and do an inspirational talk. Uh, and there's a place for that. And it's very transactional. You know, you can psych people up for a couple of days, maybe a week, you know, and then we are creatures of habit. You know what I mean? And so I felt uh, that I was gravitating more towards transformational stuff. So working on deeper levels with people, looking at value systems, you know, what governs the way we behave, values and beliefs, you know, past experiences of hurt and joy and whatever it is behind these lenses that's affecting the way we show up in the world. And then once again, I was really blessed uh, to get a scholarship to pursue uh, coaching studies at the Integral Coaching Center in Bergfleet, um, where I studied under um, Dr. Paddy Paisley. Um, is an amazing soul and, and she does executive coaching and she's extremely passionate about raising the level of consciousness in communities, particularly at a leadership level, you know. And so See, and the one thing I like about coaching, which is, is so different in a sense from psychotherapy, is although the past is important in looking at the obstacles that you need to overcome, one doesn't dwell in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't sit there blaming your mother for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a place for psychotherapy, you know. Sure, I mean? absolutely. And so, yeah, and so coaching for me essentially is, is – uh, this is my sort of 15 second elevator pitch which people ask me what coaching is. It's, I create a safe space for people to get out of their own way of living into their fullest potential. And of course it's very different from an inspirational talk because in a sense you've got to step back as you say. You've Absolutely. got to step back and let them find their own answers. Absolutely. Because um, coaching so. believes that people have the wisdom. They just need a space, a safe space free of judgment. And, uh, and the right questions. Amen. For somebody to facilitate their thinking and help them to tap into their own wisdom. So now, what is um, you're invited to be part of an emerging artist mentee program? Oh, that was a, a year or two ago. Yeah, three music. Because that was, again, Dr. Trevor Jones. You've worked with yeah. extraordinary people. <laughs> yeah, no, that was through M Martin Myers, and, uh, who's the founder of Music Exchange. Okay. And um, he connected me with uh, Trevor Jones. And I mean, not a lot of people know, but I mean, Trevor Jones is one of the top world film composers, Lost of the Mohicans, mm. Notting Hill. We've interviewed him here a few times. On Absolutely. The so you know the, mm. the spiel, you know. And so and that he's returned to South Africa. Amazing. Absolutely. And he's from here. And it's beautiful. That's a story. You know what I mean? So, And RJ Benjamin. So uh, I've been really blessed to have opportunities to, s to really sit down, have coffee with them and sort of pick their brain, you know, and, and, and 
get advice and guidance from them about uh, so the industry. Your process through life, the cancer, the 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 the, um, um, like the coaching, and I'm I'm hearing that you are you're you're a Christian. Is that also true? Is your I'm, faith? I'm a Muslim. Oh, you're my a Muslim, dad, I apologize. Yeah, no, my dad was Christian, and uh, he embraced Islam when my mom and, and even when they got married. And so, because of I grew up in a very liberal household, and I always like to reference Bob Marley over here because his dad was white and his mom was 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 black, you know. Um, and it was inherent in his DNA for him to not be able to choose. He had love and respect for, for both. Sure. You know what I mean? And so I think that has become such a fundamental aspect of who I am that I have this deep, profound love for both Islam and Christianity. You know what I mean? But you, so, you've um, definitely chosen a faith based life as such. And, yeah. and are you, you're a practicing Muslim? I, I'm a conscious Muslim. So, in other words, I'm not perfect. But I, I, I'm I'm mindful of the fact that of where I come from, um, um, why I'm here, particularly post the cancer experience, and 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 where I'm going afterwards. You know what I mean? And so, from that perspective, yeah, that's what I mean when I say conscious. Yeah. I. I have to end the interview now. I think it's wonderful. It's, you know, it, it, it's 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 um, you've got depth, you've got integrity, you've you've got you've got everything. I can see why all of these amazing people saw something in you. Thank you. I mean, your your. I hope it comes through in the interview, but your 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 brilliance in, in just in terms of your shining like a diamond, she really really, really good. comes Thank through. You. Thank you so Thank very you. much okay. for spending the time. Now, do I get to hear a song? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> I'll definitely be uh, giving you guys a song and, and then also just to mention um, there is a crowdfunding campaign happening at the moment where I'm trying to appeal to any organizations, whether it's cancer organizations or, or NGOs or small, medium-sized businesses that really resonate with the story of um, yeah, creating a, a video and I'd love to see to feature cancer survivors in the video. You know, one of my best performances close to my heart and I've had many performances, was two or three years ago performing at the annual Cancer Survivors Summit at Kirsten Bosch Gardens. And it's amazing. Just imagine you've got this huge space and it's f just full of survivors. Yeah, it from, must be extraordinary. From one year to two years, yeah. I was a guy with a 25-year brain brain cancer survivor and I sang the redemption song there. And for me, that those are the performances that just resonate the most with me. I've been invited now recently to perform in November at the Cape Town Society for the Blind at their graduation, you know, so I, I love those causes, man, you know, and, and to see these people achieve things despite their challenges, you know. So I mean, if you know. people want to help you, yeah. how do they get hold of you? So I'm on Facebook, it's Rushdin Jazz, R-O-E-S-H-D-I-E-N, and it's with one Z, jazz, not two. It's not jazz. Two, jazz. Jazz. <laughs> and I'm also, my website is rushdinjazz.com. You can also catch me on Twitter, Mr. Jazz 11, and, and on Insta as well. And so basically, I'm appealing to the public or organizations. Uh, um, well, from a public perspective, if people would love to get involved in whatever capacity and or donate 100 Rand towards uh, the crowdfunding campaign, I've aligned with an amazing film production company called Image and Heart and an award-winning film director by the name of Desmond Denton. And uh, we've partnered uh, to... Um, um, bring my story to the big, big screen so that we can hopefully inspire courage, hope, and faith for many others going through personal life challenges. So, yeah, so uh, if anybody would like to know more, I'll definitely leave my details with, with you guys as well, and they can connect with me on Facebook as well. So, that's uh, you can also uh, rushedinjazz.com. That's uh, yeah. jazz with one Z. That's yeah. a good place to start. Yeah, thank yeah. you very, very much. Very great. Well, thank you for having me. Very great.